We have a tagline for the exhibition which says the unruly presence of an intimate future. And that gives you a sense already of the fact that this exhibition points to the presence of the future. It's about the fact that the future is already here and we are in a sense eavesdropping on that presence. And this exhibition is a result of that eavesdropping, that overhearing of the murmurs, the whispers, sometimes the screams and shouts and, and, and exclamations of delight that the future brings with it in its wake into the present. Conceptually, we offer the premise that not only do we live in the future, we must also sort of uh, acknowledge that fact, stop deferring the idea of the future and pay attention to what it is that we um, are generating, what it is that we are creating, what it is that we are taking with us as we go along um, into the future, whether is it open, out there, shared by us, consensually or, or uh, with uh, disagreement, um, but also things that are hidden, that may be in plain sight and are still hidden, all the things that are indeed hidden under the, under the Mm, uh, whether it's as you will see in the exhibition whether it is an underwater line that connects all the internet across continents together which is there but we don't know it we think of the internet as being completely sort of airy but actually it's not it's full of hardware but also there are things that we do know which are felt by the body the heart the mind in different registers and for which we sometimes don't have a language what it does is ex experience a series of affective or conceptual problems or intimations that it tries to play on for that we have a series of sources that aided us in our thinking so we start with seven eight eight sources that we draw from various uh, intellectual and uh, what practice traditions in all over the world from that that activates us into taking a journey to various uh, geometries and geographies, various different biographies and uh, kind of incomplete and aborted biographies. So all these things that shape the contemporary is what we take. So it's a kind of a procession of the contemporary which starts with the frog and ends with how we sculpt darkness. What it does is to provide an opportunity to the visitor to in a sense experience the world in an amphibious state between worlds, across worlds, breathing, if you like, with both the lungs and the gills, thinking, if you like, both with the brain and the heart and the guts, and walking on legs and on thin air. Um, there are four rooms, um, but they're all connected by, uh, two or th by two or three markings that we call curatorial markings. One is a field of blue that expands over the entire building. Um, it changes the quality of light, it changes the quality of air, it changes the quality of transparency that you have in the building. Um, it asks you to be aware of all of these things. So in that sense, it's also asking you to be aware of awareness itself. Another marking is, as Jibesh has talked about, the sources. Um, and you can see them also in the exhibition. They are shared with, uh, with the people who are coming to the exhibition. Um, another marking is a kind of um, slash, a cut, into the wall of the building itself, which allows work from one side of the divide of the wall to actually start leaching in, to start uh, pouring in, uh, infecting even um, what exists within. So this idea also of separation and looking at things in separate categories is blurred, uh, like life is blurred. You will start by seeing a piece by Huma Mulji, who is an artist based uh, in Karachi and in, in the UK. It's a piece that brings simultaneously a, a landscape of peace and violence and disruption. What you will see next is a painting by Hieronymus Bosch but called the Hay Wayne but the camera is constantly moving on it slowly and able to pinpoint for you a frog that is falling possibly falling from the sky into the water or elevating um, and this is uh, bridged by another frog 500 years later from Bosch to Gerard who has um, made a simulation using code of um, of a frog who was so it's a replica a, a portrait of a frog who was taken into space in the early 90s in which they were trying to make reproduction possible for vertebrates a kind of proto test for the future of humanity into deep space the, the second room is uh, a room that has uh, a sense of a collective will of various different explorations, some subterranean, some older sensibilities, some kind of 
kind of taking into a trans extraterrestrial sensibilities thinking through a different idea of a sky different idea of cosmos so what you have is the geba uh, paintings they are called geba paintings which are basically uh, women in uh, china and from 60s and 70s painted with fabrics left over from the stitching of clothes or shoes or whatever they were doing at home or quilt and they took out the fabrics and part of the small fabric they made as artworks which they gifted to each other over a long period about 10 years immediately in front of bhagwati prasad's homage to begampura is a, a kind of cavern or a cave or a fruit or the belly of the building it could be an egg it could be a belly it could be a fruit and when you a cave and when you go inside it you discover a world of flight and fantasy there's a there's a library of books uh, ranging from a uh, Uh, from fantasies for children to science fiction for adults which are arranged as if there were rockets taking off into the dome of this of the orange sky of this of this belly when you come out of that uh, cave you you see um, a large underground an image of a large underground space a um, larger than life size wallpaper rendition of pipes or cabling or other mysterious passageways uh, within which entangled is a human figure in a protective suit kabelo malatsi she is a curator from johannesburg and uh, she is a young curator and she has a long research she has been conducting over the idea of energy and also she looks at popular culture she looks at the different kind of music forms that produce that gives her an intuition into a probably another way of imagining a future imaginations of energy so the third chapter the third space is imagined also um for the for the for the movement that people are doing in terms of clusters which i think we have worked with in the entire exhibition the throw of rocks for example that happened in christina lucas's piece which is being done in you know these factory workers or people who used to work in this factory are, are throwing rocks at the glass facade of the old of the old factory but also it feels like when you're in the exhibition it feels like that throw it continues on to the work of mohanad shunno who is levitating far above and um is which in itself has another kind of expulsion another kind of spatialization of force that is happening there's long pieces there are short pieces um um sort of tethered to each other by a, a, a few sculptural presences one is a piece by marzia farhana who is an artist from bangladesh who has brought together machinic the painterly and um uh and the and the sort of hyperbolic in terms of the children's toys all to create a landscape which is you don't know if it is being sucked back or vomited out of the earth um and there's another sculptural piece of that order which is the piece by Hassan Khan which is called Bank Banister which is basically a reproduction of the bank banister of the Misra bank in Egypt which has since crashed um which of course asks leads you to ask the question as to what stays and uh, what forces destroy what and uh, what is it that we think is permanent and what is um uh, what is it actually that shakes up this permanence and clearly there are certain flows that are shaking up structures of this order and all of those flows are being touched upon and echoed and amplified by the different levels and kinds of work that we see in in, in this large um in this large space uh, the banister by hasan khan in some ways almost bisects the space and you don't know whether it's a staircase going up or down because it it has in a sense dematerialized this uh, tension between elevation and descent marks a lot of the spaces because the room becomes almost a kind of sn a snapshot of the 20th century encapsulating many of its tensions many of its productive moments its enormous capacity to produce material uh, wealth and for instance in a, which is very well encapsulated in a work by uh, Dylan marsh uh, where you see um, landscapes of what were once copper mines in which you s in which there is the strange haunting presence of spheres of copper or other precious materials which embody the entire value that would have been extracted from that mine uh, similarly you see um, uh, a man running 
perhaps against, perhaps towards the sun. It's a kind of moving GIF, a work by Mark Chung, which again proposes this kind of idea of relentless movement. One doesn't know towards or away from a source of energy. You see, um, you see similar displacements of 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 productive potential in the work, for instance, of um, Bahar Nurizadeh, who has an entire sort of essay film, a travelogue, a road movie, if you like, on the production of hallucinogenic potentials through the. Uh, hashish fields of the Beka Valley in Lebanon. Uh, you have many other such instances where energy, intensity and intoxication are evoked and then dissolved into a field of consciousness. There's also an enactment of different forms of knowing and questioning the world whether it's through forms of poetry, as Monica said, written by artificial intelligence, whether it's through the simulation of organic life, whether it's through speculative mathematical questioning, and as in Abhishek Ajra's work, uh, or astrophysics, or a kind of hybrid fantasist botany, as in the work of Rohini Devashar, who creates um, the, the large images which embody for her the idea of genetic drift, the shifting of, of DNA between organisms in, within generations, or it's uh, a reformulation of the optics of visibility in darkness, which we see in Ivana Franke's work. Ivana's work is a zone of complete pitch darkness when you walk in you're almost shocked into um, becoming static you don't know what it is that you've entered into but if you give it when you give it a bit of time you start to realize that your eyes dilate and in that a new world is opened up she has used um, quite analog technologies actually along with uh, machines and sensor control to um, allow you to actually see things which you didn't think you could see and darkness uh, and, and darkness is mm, made completely different when you step into noise, which is the work of Lanti and Shi, where he's working with, this, with machine sounds and um, other kind of rude, as rude, sounds. rude right. sounds of life. But, it makes life. but those are the sounds that make the machine and life possible. And it was for important for us also to think about these two categories of noise and darkness, not as negative categories but as uh, as categories as, of, of potential of of uh, of generation and that same sense of what happens to our ligatures our muscles our skin our nervous system is um, processed through a series of exquisite drawings by a man who saw himself perhaps as an artist but the world recognized as a scientist who is Santiago Ramon y Cajal the great pioneering neuroscientist of the early 20th century and he produced um, drawings of nerve endings and what he was able to show with his drawings was the fact that nerves were not contiguous but straddled absences and gaps which he calls synapses and it is those synapses which were the spaces of electrical signals and transmissions and the work of curating an exhibition is a lot like joining nerve cells with space allowing for those electrical charge and electrical transmission to communicate itself across a vast body. We should mention is the work by Gamyang Chang, uh, the work by Gamyang which is um, a very mysterious work because you think what you're looking at is a mannequin which is also a machine which is also a possible uh, stalker, which is also a possible erotic partner, in relationship with Gamhyang herself, it is partly performance, it is partly animation, and it is also simultaneously a, a rendering of a relationship between the body and the machine in ways that we um, actually do have, but again are often shy about admitting. And it's really interesting the way Gamhyang is um, positioned and propositioned it back into our everyday life.